Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast brought to you by the last man standing with loserpool.com. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simu. And on this edition, I'm joined in the man cave by my guest, Mike Stavrou. Mike, welcome back to the Chronicles, mate. How have you been? Yeah, good. I've uh, been resting up, been um, getting away from Arsenal as much as I can, to be honest, just to try and give you that that mental space. like a Think of it like a spa and wellness uh, retreat away from Arsenal because it's so stressful but you know pre-season's back now so time to get back into the mode and uh, yeah that's it exactly pre-season is well and truly underway Arsenal held to a draw at Boreham Wood uh, but that's not something we're going to focus on too much because the the group of players that took part in that game are, were a mixture of, of very young players and I'm not uh, expecting any of them to have any impact in the first team this season I'm not expecting any of them to be called upon so I don't think it's worth dwelling on that game. It was the start of pre-season. Um, it, it's a fitness exercise at the end of the day. But something that is worth talking about is uh, Stan Kroenke, the Arsenal owner. Now, there have been some protests organised uh, in the last few weeks or so uh, regarding his ownership. I understand why fans are frustrated with the way the club is heading. I understand why people don't necessarily like him as an owner. But in your opinion, Mike... Are these protests worth the time? Are they worth the bother? Do you think we can see any results off the back of this? No, and the the things with this, I mean, I totally understand why people are, as you said, upset with him. And I am personally because he's a guy, ultimately, this uh, the only word to describe him is, is ap- apathetic. He's a businessman. He's cold. He's calculated. He uh, has other business interests. The LA Rams in, in the NFL, I think they're his main focus. That's his primary success. Whereas other owners, you know, their sole focus is on their their football club and we don't have an owner that has that. So I completely understand people are upset. They want someone who cares. Um, They want someone who actually turn up uh, to to the big games like he wasn't at the Europa League final. I know Josh was, but it's not the same thing. And um, just with the protests, I just think it's a complete and utter waste of time because ultimately, what, there was a few hundred people um, across both the the Boromwood a game and also um, at the kit launch as well. There's a few people protesting there and oh, he's, he's not going to care, is he? I mean, he probably hasn't even heard about it, hasn't seen it and it's going to take a lot more. I think it's going to take people actually boycotting games where it actually starts to affect the, the match day revenue. People not renewing their season tickets to actually affect the business side of it, which, let's be honest, is not going to happen because people want to go and watch the, the football team regardless of what's going on, you know, above. And... Um, in terms of Kroenke himself, I think it's just going to take a massive, massive amount of money, uh, which frankly no one can afford to buy him out because his shares are w- worth between three and six billion or something like that. That's what he paid Usman of to, to buy him out for sole ownership. So, yeah, in short, I don't think it's going to have any impact at all. I think for me, I completely understand why people are protesting. I'm not happy with Stan Kroenke's ownership. For me, his biggest crime is the fact that he doesn't seem to care and that he's never around more than the money thing. A lot of people talk about him putting his hand in his pocket and investing. That's never going to happen. We know the model that Arsenal are working under and it's a self-sustaining model. How many times have we heard that term? So we shouldn't be surprised by the fact that he's not going to, you know, start putting money into the club. And we also know that there's FFP rules. And I know that these rules are a little bit questionable. There are other clubs who have... uh, you know, found ways around it, not mentioning any names, but Manchester City, for example, who constantly seem to get around this whole concept. But like I said, I don't really take issue with the money thing. It it bothers me, but it's not my biggest concern. My biggest concern is, like you said, he doesn't turn up, he doesn't care, and that just drives the wrong behaviours within the club, if you ask me. Now, do I think these protests will make any difference? I don't, if I'm honest. I think that... Like you said, unless people actually stop going, unless the stadium's empty week in, week out, etc., then this is not really going to do anything. But having said that, the few people that have protested managed to get themselves in the news uh, you know, for it. So there is some attention on this. There is people taking notice of it. But there's only one man that needs to take notice. And at the moment, I don't feel that that's happening. But you made a good point off air earlier, though, uh, regarding the club trusting or, or Kroenke trusting the club or the people that are in those positions, to do right with the money if he was to invest it. What, what did you mean by that? Yeah, I just mean in terms of not even just with um, him trusting Unai Emery and the, and the recruitment side of it and going and getting players because they might 
or might not turn out to be successful. I just mean in terms of how the club is run financially. Ivan Gazidis ran us into the ground with some of the decisions he made. Um, for instance, letting Ramsey run out his contract when he probably would have been worth about 40, 50 million at very least. Um, Serge Nabry, another one of the, the players we let go too early, who um, we sold for 8 million. And now, last season, he won uh, Bayern's best player of the season or probably worth like... 50 60 and that's the case where you can double and triple and quadruple and 10 times your money and it, it wasn't taken and it's not just these of recent times it's been going on for years and years and that sort of relationship um on the business side of things has not is, is it's not worked out let's be honest so if i was stan croaky now from even a business point of view not a football point of view saying would i trust you know these guys with my money the the answer is probably not so the fans are saying spend some money spend some money first is as you mentioned very clearly ffp rules allow um clubs to doesn't allow sorry clubs to just pump money into it and it'll be interesting to see actually what happens with um with man city because there is this whole um thing about if they'll get banned from the champions league and what actually happened recently with, with ac milan as you all know as you, you cover a lot of um a lot of italian football they've been banned on the Europa League for similar things to do with, with agents and players, um, the the money not quite being right. So I hope actually that sets a bit of a precedent to say that some of these clubs can be banned. But um, just in, in terms of the actual football side of things, um, as a business man, uh, I don't think Kroenke would trust would trust the Arsenal. I, I agree with you. And I think that the way the club's finances have been mismanaged only back up that point in recent seasons. And I, I don't blame him for being reluctant to put money in. But just touching on that AC Milan thing is quite an interesting story because although people are reporting that AC Milan have been banned, the way the statement was worded suggests that in actual fact, AC Milan have volunteered to stay out of European competition as a punishment for breaking the FFP rules. Yeah, That's I how they've kind of worded it. And it's, yeah. it feels like the two parties have come to some sort of an agreement mm. to try and you know, manage the damage of breaking these rules. So yeah, I did speak to someone actually, an, an Italian football expert recently, and he kind of explained it to me in the way that, um, so they were meant to be banned uh, last year or two years ago, uh, but that that didn't go through, that got taken out. So it, it, essentially that ban was always in the, in the midst, but it just hadn't gone through. I think they gave them a chance to sort out their finances and that didn't happen. So I think, you know, that that, that story was a bit, a bit, um, not not reported too well, I think. Yeah, but agreed. Yeah, it definitely was, you know, the reason that they are banned is because they mismanage finances and I just hope this stuff starts to happen more. Absolutely, absolutely. It is the 8th of July. Uh, Arsenal have not done any significant transfer business. Of course, Gabriel Martinelli's been brought in uh, from Brazil, a youngster, probably one for the future. What are your feelings on that deal and the window overall so far? Yeah, just uh, quickly on Martinelli, on my Love Sport radio show, which I did yesterday, uh, I spoke to a Brazilian football expert and he said to me that Martinelli is not even one of the highest rated prospects in Brazil, which does make me worry a little bit. You know, he's one for the future. He said he'll need a lot more experience, um, so probably go out on loan, to be honest. Um, which, actually, I had something to say about that because I thought it's sort of hindering the the progress of our youngsters, right? So that, that we've brought through the academy. If we're bringing in someone from Brazil for, was it four million, eight million pounds, something like that. Um, it'll be hindering like the progress of someone like Nketiah or Tyrus John Jules, which I felt a bit upset about, to be honest with you, because we're not going to be bringing in big money. Then we need these academy prospects to really come in and, and try and uh, and get a spot somewhere in the in the first team, whether that's Europa League or League Cup or something. But um, on the transfer activity in general, I mean, it just shows where we're at, Harry, when we're spending four million pounds on a youngster from Brazil, that's an unknown quantity, and Spurs are spending 65 million on, you know, a potentially world-class central midfielder in uh, Tanga and Dombele. So that sums it up, doesn't it? I mean, for me, I'm not too this. Uh, th the thing with Martinelli, I don't mind bringing in someone young who you're taking a little bit of a risk on for five, six million pounds because it could pay off and the benefit would be huge. But where I do take issue is if that's your only transfer business and. I think perhaps are we sort of losing our shit a little bit too early this summer, is it? You know, we've still got about a month left of the transfer window. I know we got the deals done earlier last season, but do you feel like maybe we should sort of hold fire a little bit? Uh, do you think Arsenal are working on some potential deals in the background? We keep hearing about 
the likes of Tierney being linked, the likes of Saliba. Uh, this whole Zaha thing is going to rumble on now, you'd imagine, for the, the remainder of the summer. Do you think it's a little bit early and, and to panic? I mean, deals are sort of best done when you don't really hear about them. So last season, uh, Arsenal obviously had their targets even before Emery was named manager, I think. And they got Leno done quickly. They got Torreira done quickly. They got Socrates done quickly. All in time for pre-season. We're now turning up to pre-season with no players in. And that does worry me. And I think that if you want a player, you know who it is about six months ago. And um, apparently last week, I don't know if this is true or not, but um, Arsenal bosses had a meeting with Stan Kroenke to ask him for more funds. Which that, that, that story does worry me a bit. Because it's like if you haven't identified who you want and the money you're going to potentially pay for them that does concern me with the Zaha thing I mean that is just an, a massive joke how can you offer 40 million 10 million pounds less than they paid for wan Bissaka and expect them to do business with us let's just be honest that deal is not going to happen but also what that showed me is that if we're bidding 40 million pounds on one player we obviously have a bit more money than we're letting on because that would have been our entire transfer budget so let's be a bit realistic with that with Kieran Tierney I don't know what's going on with that because I think they've said in the in the media I've read that that deal's ready to be done. It's just actually putting the money forward which they want. They've, I think we bid seventeen point five million. It was that was rejected. If they're asking for twenty five, just go and pay it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, let us know what you think in the comments section below regarding the transfer activity we've done so far, the transfer activity we've been linked with doing. And are you concerned at this stage or is it a little bit too early to be hitting the panic button? Let us know. So it's quite clear that we agree. Arsenal have lots of areas in which they need to improve. And, you know, there's a need for some new recruits and fresh blood at the club. What are the positions that are a priority to you, though? I mean, of course, defence, uh, Harry. I mean, we all can see where the where the problems are, but um, also wingers. We, we we need wingers desperately because I think Emery had to adapt so much last season based on what he didn't have, and that was a clear winger. We had Mkhitaryan, who's sort of like an inside forward. It won't be who for me doesn't cut the mustard. So, weight width is what we need, and what that allows is like for our full backs to be slightly more defensive, which will help with us defensively. I personally can't wait for Hector Bellerin to come back. I think we missed him so much. And there's been talk as well. We can. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, talks about making him captain. Do you think that's a good move? Me personally, I don't think he's quite leader material. I don't think he's the type of leader on the pitch. I guess the argument for making Hector Bellerin captain is that he's been so influential off the pitch. He's been speaking out against some... Uh, you know, really good causes such as racism, discrimination, etc. He's really good in that sense and he sets a fantastic example and he shows the club in a very good light. So I understand why those people do say make Hector Bellerin the captain. I I'm kind of on the fence about this because I think that whilst he's a great example off the field and commercially he'd be a great captain, I'm not quite sure that he's ready to go in and rumble people and ruffle people's feathers when things aren't going to plan. So I'm kind of on the fence on this one. Uh, and the only reason I'm probably entertaining the idea is because I can't see another leader there. I, I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, is that, uh, that's the point I was going to make. I mean, did you see the story last week about uh, Lon Cajoni saying he's going to terminate his contract? That that worried me a little bit. I was like, is, is he that desperate to go out? Are we that, that bad at negotiating that we can't find him another club? And I mean, I'm not saying we get a lot of money for him, but um, he was the one, really. Like, if, if he was going to stay, then... I'd, I'd look to Kachoni because I think you know yeah. he's he's the biggest leader, um, but potential other people, Xhaka. And I, I know that that you you're not a massive fan, and I I didn't used to be, but I mean you you need it in a sort of commanding position. Maybe Socrates. I know he hasn't been there that long, but he is a natural leader. But um, to be honest, I just think the whole captain thing doesn't mean much these days. But going just going back to transfers quickly. Um, Kieran Tierney at left back, I think, would be sensational. I mean, only second to uh, to Robertson, um, and that's the only reason that uh, he was removed as Celtic captain. But um, sorry, not uh, Scottish Scotland. captain. So I meant. Um, so he'd be really good, and it just means it would take the pressure off um, Monreal, and potentially Kalasnach could leave, and that's a position that we we really need. So winger. And uh, left back as well as centre back, but you know, on this William Saliba thing as well, I wanted to get your thoughts on that. I mean, are we really going to pay twenty-seven, thirty million pounds for a player 
that's 18, and then send him back on loan when we need a defender. Well, I'm not entirely sure why everybody is so fussed about William Saliba, if I'm being honest. I've spoken to various people who, you know, follow the French game, and he's not really set the world on fire. He's not played that many games last season. Why everybody thinks that we should go and blow such a large proportion of our transfer budget on a centre-back who probably isn't ready to come into the Arsenal first team and make an impact, on a centre-back who whose club are quite eager to get him back on loan. It just makes no sense. Arsenal need to go and buy a ready-made central defender, in my opinion. And even if it's someone a little bit older, just to get us through this transitional period and get us back into the Champions League. At the moment, we are heading into our third season without Champions League football. And for me, it's great to plan for the long term. Of course it is. But there needs to be a bit of short-term planning here as well because the longer we stay out of the Champions League, the worse this situation is going to get the more of a mess our finances are going to be in. And all of a sudden, we've gone from being a Champions League big hitter to now a Europa League club working on a Europa League budget, bringing in Europa League standard players. And and for me, the job of Unai Emery was to come in and get us back in the Champions League by hook or by crook. And I think that if he feels that the way to do that is to go out and get somebody a little bit more experienced, a little bit more seasoned, even if it means 10, 20 million pounds, for a player that only lasts you one or two years, then you've got to do it. You've got to get us back in the Champions League. And I just don't really see the fuss about Saliba. And, and, and I hope, you know, if we do sign him, that he turns out to be a great player. And I love youngsters, you know, developing and impressing. But my first concern right now is Arsenal Football Club. And I don't think that's a wise move if, if we're talking about the fee that, you know, is being quoted in the press at the minute. I mean, I completely agree with you. While Unai Emery's future is still in doubt, because let's be honest, it is, he had a very average first season. His job was to get us back into Champions League. We, we failed, right? Let us be honest about that. While his future is still in doubt, and while we're not clear on what's going to happen moving forward, I think it should be short term. Our number one goal is to get back into the Champions League. And from then, after Emery's two years are up, and he still has that one year left to uh, discuss where he's going to be our manager moving forward, we give him another contract. We need to focus on the short term. And you're completely right. Why would you spend that much money on an unknown quantity? Like I'm, I'm the same as you. I have heard different things about Saliba. Though. He's very talented. He's very able. He's quite tall for his age. He's good on the ball. He's quick. But he's not going to walk straight into the team. So what is the point of that? I understand, you know, you have to take risks with young players. They're not always going to gonna work out. But sometimes they will. And sometimes you might find a hidden gem. But that is a lot of money to spend on a hidden gem who's 18. We have to keep making that point. And um, I think you're completely right. I think we need to focus on getting back into the Champions League. Um, then the money will increase. The, the, the budget that we'll have is an extra 30, 40 million pounds a season, which is uh, another player or another two players in, in our case. So um, I, I think it's, it's jumping the gun a bit with him. And um, also as well, something that we mentioned earlier, I think people need to lower their expectations when it comes to Arsenal. We're not a Champions League standing club at, at the moment. And um, people need to stop thinking, you know, we're going to spend loads of money and get the top players in. We're not. So we need to get back slowly to, to that stage where we might be in a position to spend more money. But at, at the moment, we're not. And I, I just need to make clear for everyone that's saying that um, we should sell a Bamiang or Lacazette to try and move forward. That's absolute rubbish, man. Absolutely Agreed. rubbish. Like, what a sideways and even backwards move it would be to sell Aubameyang and bring Zaha in. I mean, I, I like Wilfred Zaha. I think he's a very positive player. But I saw a stat that said Alex Awobi created more chances um, for Arsenal than he did for Palace last year. And let's be honest, at Palace, he would have got the ball as much as he wanted. He would yeah. have had it much more than Awobi. And yeah, but people were saying that he has, less, he has um, not as good players around him, which is true. But if he has not good players around him, they're going to pass him the ball more, which gives him the opportunity to do more. So I think that's that's complete madness. Yeah, I agree. I don't think we should be selling our best players under any circumstances. I don't see how that would represent a step forward in any way. But also just touching on Zaha before we wrap it up. I think that Wilfred Zaha playing in a team who traditionally sit back and play on the counter-attack is a completely different proposition. If he does come to the Arsenal, he's going to be faced by stubborn defences sitting on the edge of their penalty areas, and it's a very different challenge. And, uh, you know, it remains to be seen whether he would be able to handle that. And I'm not against signing Wilfred Zaha. I'm against paying £70, £80 million pounds for him, though. No question about that. So we'll have to see, uh, of course, how that story develops. And I want to say a big thank you 
uh, to every single one of you who's tuned in. Uh, to those of you watching on YouTube, hit the like and subscribe button. And to those of you uh, listening to the audio, don't forget to leave us a review. We'll be back tomorrow with another video. Big thanks to Mike Stavrou. Uh, do you want to let them know how they can follow you as well? Yeah, I'm on Twitter. I'm at Mike underscore Stavrou, S-T-A-V-R-O-U. Um, give us a follow on, on Love Sport Radio as well. That's, that's where I work for primarily. Yeah. Great stuff. Until tomorrow, take care.